Chapter 6, in which Green and Tom run a race which proves disastrous to both. Clang, 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 clang. Hello, what's the matter? cried Tom in the midst of this clatter as he jumped out of bed and rubbed his eyes. The cause of the din was a large iron-tongued bell, which Mr. Middleton was ringing right lustily. Tom looked about him. All the students, with the exception, of course, of several of the old boys, who were quite accustomed to this unearthly sound, were up and dressing. "'It's a little too early for me,' thought Tom, and, satisfied that the horrid bell had become silent, he turned in again. He was peacefully dozing off, when a hand was laid upon him. "'Playfair, did you hear the bell?' "'Did I? I should think I did. That's all right, Mr. Middleton, but I guess I don't care about getting up just now.' The sentence was barely out of his mouth, when, as it appeared to him, there was a mild form of earthquake in the vicinity, and before he could realize that anything had happened at all, he was sprawling on the floor with the mattress on top. "'I say, what did you do that for?' he sputtered, but Mr. Middleton was already halfway down the aisle. "'If that's the way they treat a fellow the first day, what'll they do on the last?' he murmured. "'I don't think this school is much account anyhow.' On rising, the boys were allowed half an hour for washing and dressing. Then came mass, followed by studies and breakfast. At nine o'clock, on this particular day, they had what is technically termed lectio brevis, that is, the teachers of the respective classes give their boys a short talk and appointed lessons for the next day. Tom was mildly surprised and a trifle dismayed when he discovered that his teacher for the year was none other than Mr. Middleton. But after listening in silence for some minutes to his professor's opening speech, he concluded that perhaps things might not be so bad. The Lectio Brevis was compressed into an hour, and the students had the rest of the day free. Shortly after dinner, Harry Quip, accompanied by a strange boy, approached Tom. "'Tom, here's a particular friend of mine, Willie Ruthers.' and I'm sure he'll be a great friend of yours. Willie and Tom shook hands, while Will murmured sheepishly, Happy to see you. Won't you take some candy? inquired Tom. The candy was gratefully received, and the friendship of the two was firmly based. Have you been out walking yet? asked Willie. No, and that's a fact. Harry, we ought to go get that hat of mine at Pawnee Creek. Obtaining permission from the prefect, they set out on their walk along the railroad track, and in the course of time discovered the hat partially embedded in the mud. When on their return they came near the college, Harry proposed that they should pass through the Bluegrass. The Bluegrass is a favorite resort of the boys. It lies just beyond the college yard, and is well shaded with large, graceful pine trees. It chanced on this particular day that the only occupants of the blue grass were John Green and three lads of similar taste. Green caught sight of our trio from afar. "'Oh, I say, boys,' he exclaimed, "'here comes the funny man.' "'Come on here, you sneak,' he added, addressing himself to Tom, "'and we'll settle our accounts.' "'Tom,' whispered Harry earnestly, "'let's run.' Those fellows with him won't let me or Willie help you, and Green has been acting like a bully since he's come back from vacation. I'm not going to run unless I've got to, answered Tom, and he walked straight on, intending to pass by Green and his following. But Green put himself squarely in the trio's path. Where are you going, funny man? he inquired. I'm going to St. Mars this year. How's your shin? "'You've got to fight me, you sneak!' pursued Green, reddening with anger at the retort. "'But I don't want to fight, you see. "'I don't care a cent what you want. "'Put up your hands. I'll teach you to sass me. "'You can't get out of it.' "'Can't I, though? Catch me!' And as Tom spoke, he dashed away in the direction of Pawnee Creek. It took some seconds for Green to realize this sudden and unexpected change of front. Then, with a shout of wrath, he gave chase." 
Before leaving home, it may be explained, Tom had made a solemn promise to his Aunt Meadow not to engage at fistcuffs under any circumstances. He was a good runner for his age, but he lacked the speed of his older and longer-legged pursuer. Although he had obtained a start of some twenty-five or thirty feet, he perceived presently that he was losing ground rapidly. For all that, the serenity habitual to his chubby face did not diminish one whit, and as he turned his head from time to time to make a reconnaissance, his expression was as tranquil as though he were racing for amusement. The scene was an interesting one. Tom was followed by Harry and Willie, while Green was cheered on by his three cronies, who were also hot in pursuit. Before Tom had got clear of the bluegrass trees, he saw that he was sure of being captured, unless he could introduce some new feature into this flight. His intervention did not fail him. Suddenly he turned sharply, and, assisted by a tree which he caught hold of, turned at a right angle to his former line of retreat. In nimbleness, Green could not compare with Tom, and so, before he could adjust himself to the change, our hero obtained a new lease of flight. All were now speeding toward the line of low bluffs which fronted the blue grass, and divided it off from the prairie land beyond. But it seemed quite evident that Tom could not hold out long enough to gain the bluffs. Nearer and nearer panted Green. "'He was coming along in short pants,' Harry Quip subsequently remarked to some of his schoolmates, who roused his indignation and cut short his narrative with their laughter over his remarkable bull, in his case original." Well, nearer and nearer came the pursuer. The interval between the two was scarcely twelve feet. "'You're gone, Tom!' cried Harry. "'It's no use!' added Willie Ruthers, as he ceased running. "'You can't get away!' Tom was now within twenty-six yards of the bluff, while his pursuer was but six or seven feet behind. Suddenly Tom came to a full stop, turned, and as his pursuer shot on, whisked aside and put out his foot. Green took the foot offered him, and went right on, not as a runner, but more after the manner of a flying squirrel. He came down on all fours on a soft bank of earth, and in no wise injured picked himself up. But before he was well on his feet, Harry Quip had come to the rescue with a suggestion. "'Tom! Tom!' he cried, running, as he spoke, at an angle towards the bluff. "'Run this way, for all you're worth! We're near Keenan's cave, and if we can make it, we'll bar them out!' Long before Harry had ceased speaking, Tom was making for this prospective sanctuary. The cave in question was fronted by a rough, clumsy wooden structure, in general appearance not unlike a storm door. Tom's eyes grew brighter. He felt sure of himself now. Once within the cave, Harry, Willie, and himself might bid defiance to all outside. Nearer and nearer loomed the cave. One hundred and fifty feet more and all was well. Green was far behind and was not running as at first. But alas! As Tom, with his eyes fixed on the refuge, was making bravely on, he struck his foot against a stone and fell violently to the ground. It was an ugly fall. But Green did not pause to make inquiries. Throwing himself upon Tom, he proceeded to strike him, blow after blow, upon the partially upturned face. In falling, Tom had incurred an ugly cut on the head. The pain was intense, more than enough to bear without the savage attacks of Green. "'Give up what?' groaned Tom, who, dizzy and weak and suffering as he was, could not take his tormentor seriously. The bully continued his brutal work. Tom's condition was becoming serious. Harry and Willie, who had attempted to come up with his assistance, were forcibly held back by Pitch and his companions. "'Now will you give up?' asked Green, again pausing. Tom felt that he was fainting. Lights flickered before his eyes. Strange noises rang in his ears. For all that, he had no idea of giving up. Summoning all his strength, he said in almost his natural tones, "'I think you asked me that before.' "'Well, I'll punch you so you won't even know yourself next time!' Green never finished his speech. A vigorous jerk at this juncture brought his jaws together with a snap and sent him to the grass with almost lightning-like rapidity. George Keenan stood over him. But even when released, Tom made no move. He had fainted. "'Quip!' cried Keenan. "'Run over to our cave and get some water. Quick!' 
Look at that, you low-lived bully, he continued, addressing Green. Do you see what you've done? And as George spoke, he seized the terrified boy by the collar and shook him with the energy of boiling indignation. He wouldn't give up, howled Green. Ugh, growled George, casting an anxious look at the pallid face of Tom. If I had nothing better to do, I'd be glad to spend my life shaking you up. That's it, Harry, he continued, as Quip, with a jug of water, bent over Tom. Throw it over his face. He'll be all right in a moment. George seemed to be quite absent-minded. With his eyes fixed anxiously on Tom, his hands and arms were working to and fro with such energy that it was impossible to say where Green's head was at any given moment. He made no pause, even when, seconds later, Tom's face twitched. "'Hurrah! He's coming, too!' cried Willie Ruthers, who had just thrown open Tom's collar. Willie was right. Tom opened his eyes, then with an effort raised himself on his arm. He gazed about him in a dazed manner, till his eyes fixed upon the tear-stained face of Harry Quip. He brightened at once, put his hand in his pocket, and said, "'Here, Harry, take some candy.' And Tom arose, feeble but smiling. "'Green,' said George, "'before I let you go, you must beg this boy's pardon.' "'I'll not!' "'You won't, eh?' And George annotated this remark with a shake. "'Ow, oh, stop! Yes, I beg your pardon!' "'Much obliged,' said Tom, seriously. "'Now,' continued George, "'I want you to promise me not to interfere with smaller boys. "'Do you hear? We want no bullies this year.' Oh, "'Yes!' cried Green, now shaken into a ball. "'I promise, upon my word. George, please let me go.' George acceded to this earnest request, and Green hastened away to rejoin his friends, who, at the first approach of danger, had fled. Morally speaking, Tom had won the fight.